Greetings, my dear friends. A hundred years ago began a conflict. A conflict that was most complex and controversial. A conflict that was between two people who had a lot in common, yet with different ideologies, religious beliefs and perspectives. This conflict was later called or today is called the Israeli-Palestinian pickle. That's my word, sorry. But it is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This would quickly escalate and gain center stage as far as the Middle East is concerned in particular and the world at large. This situation has worsened over the last few days. So what then is this conflict? Why did it even come about? And why is it it has not been solved thus far? What really is the problem as far as Jerusalem is concerned, a city of peace, that we have three Abrahamic religions fighting over it? Don't forget, Middle East is probably the most complex and complicated regions in the world. And the area around Israel seems to be even more so. Welcome to Chak Simplifies, your channel to demystify and simplify complex geopolitical pickles. I, Commander Chakrapani or Chaks, am your host. In this episode, we will look into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with focus mainly on modern history, the geopolitics of Israel very briefly, the wars that have happened again very briefly, and understand the role of Hamas and Fateh also the other players and finally we will dwell on where do we go from here and how do we move forward. Let's get started. The area of Palestine has been fought over by many across centuries. But let's get down to the World War I, the modern history part of it. While the World War I was about to start, Britain did what it does most and brilliantly. It promised many things to many people. It promised the Arabs independence if they help throw the Ottoman Empire. It divided up the Middle East region with France in a secret pact and under the Balfour Agreement promised the Jews a homeland if they support it. Britain won the World War I, divided up the Middle East region between themselves and French and kept the area of Palestine with itself to rule and kept that carrot of self-rule to the Palestinians and homeland to Jews. The division of the Middle East was Lebanon and Syria went to France, Palestine, Mesopotamia to Britain, Mesopotamia thereafter became Iraq and Transjordan and subsequently just Jordan. Then comes the fact that the Jews realized that they have a homeland finally and started immigrating en masse into Israel or Palestine. As they kept immigrating, the numbers kept growing. They also ended up buying a fair amount of land from the Arabs and the Palestinians were used as labor. This tilted the demographic profile of the region. As the World War II started approaching, with Nazi Germany getting after Jews, this immigration became even more. 1939, the World War II starts. And among other costs of the World War II, 6 million Jews lose their lives. No wonder the immigration into Palestine became even more pronounced. Post-war, Britain realized this area was too hot to handle and it handed it over to the newly formed United Nations as a first test case. The UN came up with a partition plan. It divided the area of Palestine into three parts. A Jewish majority part, which was about 45% of Palestine, a 
Palestinian majority part or the Arab majority part, again 45%, and retained Jerusalem with itself, which is about 10% of the area. This proposal was accepted by the Jews and they promulgated what is today called the State of Israel. This state was born on the 14th of May, 1948. The Palestinians refused to accept it and they felt that they wanted it all. The first war between the Arabs and the Israelis was fought in 1948. The Arab League put together a liberation army to throw the Jews into the Mediterranean. Right. But the war of 1948 was a victory for Israel. It resulted in the Armistice Agreement, but by then Israel had captured over 30% more land than it was originally granted. Egypt, as a part of this Armistice Agreement, got the Gaza Strip. Transjordan became only Jordan and was given the right to patrol the West Bank. This caused large-scale displacement of people. Over 700,000 Arabs got displaced from Israel, from Israel and became refugees. The Jewish communities in the Arab countries likewise got displaced and had to take refuge in Israel. Some sort of peace continued, but in 1967, Egypt and Syria, Jordan attacked Israel. This conflict was called the Six Day War. This again resulted in a spectacular Israeli victory. Israel seized the entire Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights and the whole of West Bank. Israeli settlers then started moving into Jerusalem and West Bank areas. The UN kept having its resolutions. Resolution 242 particularly condemned this, but Israel didn't bother. This laid the foundation of a close relationship of Israel with the US as the USSR supported the Arabs. It also brought into picture a demographic crisis that could happen in case the refugees came back into Israel because they would then alter the demographic profile of the country. It stoked ethnic tension and became the birth of the Palestinian conflict that Israel has. Over time, Egypt and Jordan made peace with Israel. However, the Palestinians did not. New and new groups came, kept coming up and they realized that violence did not work, nor did peace talks. At the same time, Israeli settlements continued to grow. In 1973, which is otherwise called the Yom Kippur War, Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack on Israel. Once again, this was a spectacular victory for Israel and the Arab countries decided to punish US for supporting Israel by increasing the prices of oil by as much as 70% and reducing the production by 5%. No wonder this was called the first oil shock. Under international pressure and due to geopolitical compulsions, we'll talk about that in a moment, Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. It retur returned some parts of Golan Heights while retaining most of it. It retained the West Bank and the process of settlements in the West Bank accelerated. In 1980, it decided that Jerusalem, it proclaimed actually, Jerusalem was its indivisible part and was made its capital. Tension mounted between the Israeli and the Palestinian people, especially over water supply and resources. In 1987, the Palestinians took to streets, mostly armed with stones, and started what is normally called the Intifada One. This also was the birth of Hamas, a Palestinian Islamist militant organization with the objective of destroying Israel. 
in on the 15th of November 1988, the PLO with Yasser Arafat declared Palestine as a state with Jerusalem as its capital. Over time, 136 countries have recognized Palestine. Peace was still elusive and in 1993, a fresh effort was started which was called the Oslo Agreement in which the first steps, that is, mutual recognition between Palestine and Israel and the grant of some autonomy in the Gaza Strip to the PLO and the city of Jericho. In 1995, the West Bank Partition Plan was, env was envisaged and this divided the area of the West Bank into three parts. Parts A, B, C. Part A were to be the Palestine or Palestine lib, uh, ruled areas. This was approximately 18% of the West Bank. This gave the Palestinians the first taste of self-rule. They were the Israeli controlled areas which became directly administered by Israel. This was approximately 60% of the West Bank predominantly the settlements that Israel already had. About 22% of the West Bank was called Area B or mixed areas where Palestinians had self-rule but security was in the hands of Israel. It did leave the Palestinians very dissatisfied because their movement from within their own areas was restricted or very convoluted. Negotiations continued to happen, but they failed. And as a result, the fight started all over again. In 2000, the PM candidate Ariel Sharon, along with 1,000 armed guards, went into the Temple Mount. This triggered the Intifada II. This was marked with much greater violence with suicide bombings and therefore the Israel started constructing walls around its settlement. While constructing walls, it also encroached upon areas that were actually given to the Palestinians. This wall was declared illegal by the International Court of Justice, but Intifada II resulted in over 3,000 Palestinian and 1,000 Israeli deaths. On the 14th of November 2004, Yasser Arafat died and that led to infighting between the Hamas and the Fateh. Fateh was the political front of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Fateh ruled over the West Bank and in the 2006 elections, Hamas won the area of, West, of uh, the Gaza Strip. In the year 2000, as a show of 2006, as a show of goodwill, Israel removed 8,500 Jewish settlers from the Gaza. And this had an unintended consequence. That was the settlement of Israelis or Jews in the West Bank accelerated. Focus shifted to the Gaza Strip where Hamas was in power through the elections. In 2014, Israel pounded the Gaza Strip with the objective of destroying Hamas's hideouts because Hamas had started firing multiple rockets into Israel. Since then, there has been, well, a difficult, precarious peace. But still, one has to, really speaking, accept certain realities. One. Israel is here to stay and so is Palestine. It is very difficult to carve out contiguous West Bank regions between the Palestinians and the Israeli settlements. The Fateh in control of Palestine favors talks and negotiations. Hamas does not. Hamas's objective is to destroy Israel. The status of Jerusalem is a major sticking point with all three Abrahamic religions having a stake in it. Judaism believes that they have 
the two most oldest temples were built in the area of Temple Mount and a wall there, the west wall, actually is the last remnant of these temples. As far as the Christians are concerned, Jerusalem is where Jesus Christ was crucified, resurrected and it has among the most holy chapels. The chapels or the chapel of the, or the church of holy secular, right? The Islam has great belief in the Al-Quds and the Al-Aqsa mosque where Prophet Muhammad is supposed to have ascended to heaven. Therefore, nobody owns Jerusalem or everybody owns Jerusalem. Let's take a look at the geopolitics of Israel for a moment. A quick perusal of the map will show you that Israel is surrounded by enemies that are sworn to annihilate it. The only safe side is the west where there is the Mediterranean Sea. It has three main parts, a coastal plain of approximately 50 kilometers width from east to west, the heartland without a buffer with all the important cities, centers located here. The Negev Desert in the south with two major features, the Iliad port which gives access to Israel to the Red Sea and the Gaza. The Galia region which has the Jordan River and the Sea of the Galilee, very fertile, an agricultural and manufacturing hub. The lack of strategic depth is the single most important feature or the geopolitical feature as far as Israel is concerned. A loss of a single hill, corridor, valley has dangerous consequences for Israel. A missile launched from anywhere, from the east, north or south, can target Tel Aviv, Jerusalem and any other part of Israel within minutes. The only way that Israel can secure itself is to occupy the heights, which is the Golan Heights, to secure its northern frontier and the Sinai Peninsula to secure its southern frontier. With limited friends and many enemies, it had its work cut out. It is a fortress which is perpetually under siege. Its small size means it just can't lose. It will have to do whatever it needs to survive. It can't afford to look weak and therefore cannot afford to enemy strike first. It follows a preemptive policy. It has secured itself by a relationship, a strong strategic military relationship with the US to secure its western borders, which is the Mediterranean flank. It dominates the north by controlling Golan Heights and it has secured the south by investing in a relationship and friend, friendship with Israel, with Egypt. Now you understand why it returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt after the Yom Kippur War. Right? It has no other option other than these. On the other hand, the Palestinians have been denied a state not just since 1948, but for centuries before that. They are, in many ways, refugees in their own land. They live under the military occupation of Israel. Most of these problems emerged essentially during the British rule during 1920 to 1939. Not all Palestinians, you must remember, are Arabs. They have a significant Christian and Jewish people also that work in the PLO. Palestinians, very obviously, are frustrated by the setbacks to their aspirations of an independent state. So what is the current situation? There, there are low-level conflicts, these are routine, but the last 10 days has seen a fair amount of a kinetic war that has been on. So what were the triggers here? Different people have different ideas, but my view is possibly between these three. One, the Israeli settlers started taking aggressive control of Palestinian settlements in anticipation of a ruling from the Supreme Court of Israel in their favor. They believed they would get that ruling in their favor because they had 
documents proving this land was theirs. They had bought this land from the Arabs. Israel also had imposed a limit of 10,000 people during Ramadan in the Al-Aqsa Mosque for prayers. On the 8th of May, tens of thousands actually marched into Al-Aqsa. They were stopped by the Israeli police. Israel claimed Hamas terrorists, militants, tried to occupy the Al-Aqsa Mosque using women and children as shield in the run-up to Ramadan. They were cleared using tear gas and stun grenades. Hamas responded by firing rockets from Gaza. In one night, it fired over 1,100 rockets. Since then, it has fired approximately 5,000 rockets to date. Israel launched air attacks on Hamas and Gaza, targeting specific buildings and the leaders of Hamas, massed troops at the borders and started preparing for ground attack. This situation continued till 21st of May when Egypt brokered a ceasefire starting 0 to 0 0 hours local time. The situation is volatile. Let's understand what is really Hamas all about. Hamas is probably one of the few terrorist organizations which has a territory to itself. It was founded in 1987 as an offshoot of Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt. The Hamas covenant clearly says violence as its ideology, death to Israel as its goal. In the Battle of Gaza in 2007, when it really speaking started fighting militarily with Israel, it has since then been a, been a pickle as far as Israel is concerned. Gaza itself is a 25 kilometers long, a max of 10 kilometers width strip with Israel on one side and the Mediterranean Sea on the other, a small stretch bordering Sinai, which is otherwise Egypt. It is probably the most populated state, places on earth with a population of over 2 million spread over 50% of people staying below poverty line. Over 50% unemployment, just 11 hospitals, very few schools. It relies on Israel for its supplies. However, Hamas has approximately 10,000 rockets imported from Iran via Egypt and now made with Hezbollah help, they cost just about $800. Mainly fired from schools, mosques, hospitals, even graveyards. It is the third richest terrorist organization in the world with over $700 million annually. It gets a large amount of its funds, 20 million every month from Qatar, 70 million from Iran, in addition to 15 million in terms of military assistance. Turkey provides it sanctuary and support. Extortions and taxes get about 27 million on an annual basis. It allocates most of its funds to military spending. Just 5% for reconstruction and rehabilitation. No wonder people in Gaza are in a bad shape. Hamas uses this discontent to further its own military aims and get more fighters into its ranks. On the other hand, Israel with Benjamin Netanyahu as the Prime Minister has a problem. Netanyahu has been trying to form the government for a long time unsuccessfully. He has a personal stake and he can get arrested if he is no longer the Prime Minister. If he cannot form a government by mid-June, Israel may well have its fifth general elections in two years. Israel, very obviously, wants to prevent rocket attacks from Gaza. It also wants to avoid a two-front war with Lebanon and Syria joining in favor of the Hamas from the north. Therefore, its strategy is disproportionate military action to deter. Among its options, 
is to dislodge Hamas and disperse the Gaza population. But this would result in urban warfare and unacceptable costs. There are other players here. On one hand, you have Saudi Arabia, which fears the fears Iran basically, because Iran is its contender for leadership of Muslims. Iran also controls all proxies in the Middle East, from all the Shia groups, especially in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Hazar. It threatens the Straits of Hormuz and the oil economy of the Saudis. It's also a budding nuclear power. Therefore, to secure its own end, Saudi Arabia was quite happy going along with the Abrahamic record, uh, Accords and with its approval, the UAE did so. That was followed by a number of other Arab countries. Iran, on the other hand, vows to destroy Israel. It supports a proxy war against Israel using Hezbollah and the other militant organizations, including Hamas, and supports Hamas militarily as well as monetarily. Qatar has its own reasons and it continues to punch well above the waist. The US wants to exit the Middle East and focus on the Indo-Pacific. No wonder it wanted the Abrahamic records, uh, Accords to happen so that it can stabilize the Middle East and reduce the Palestinian problem to a footnote. That did not happen because of this current crisis. China, as usual, is fishing in, middle, in troubled waters. And don't also forget, China has a lot, of, lot at stake. It has an $11 billion trade with Israel and is constructing two ports in Israel. So what now about India? India has good relations with Israel on one hand. Israel is a strategic partner, military partner, and Israel has been supporting it. On the other hand, we've always had Palestine as a friend. We also supported the two-nation policy as far as Palestine and Israel were concerned. Therefore, India has to perforce walk the tightrope. Don't forget, the Prime Minister Modi is probably among the very, very few world leaders who have been to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv as well as to Ramallah. Therefore, India will continue to promote the equilibrium, peace and tranquility with a two-nation theory going forward. So what then is the crux of this entire problem? My personal belief is it has two basic parts. One, land. Second, ideology. Ideology and religion. There is the, the fight between the Zionism and Islam, between modernity and medievalism, and very frankly, any imposition of a solution from outside without taking the local stakeholders in account is not going to be very successful. So what are the possible solutions here? The two states or the two nations is something which has been propounded long back by the United Nations, still possible. But how would one divide the West Bank? More importantly, who speaks for the Palestinians? Fateh or Hamas? Is there a willingness for peace? From Israel? Yes. From Fateh? Yes. Hamas? Absolutely no. The all or nothing policy is not really going to work. But to get Hamas on board, I believe they will have to be defeated militarily. That today seems to be a tall order. The one state policy, again possible, but very improbable. The trouble out here would be the demography. What will happen? Because suddenly you'll have a greater number of Palestinians, including the refugees who are out of Palestine would come back into this region and that would offset the majority which Jews have as far as the area of Israel is concerned. Probably not will happen. So where do we go from here? We will continue to live in very interesting times, my dear friends. The future of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the pickle will depend 
on the political acumen of its leaders. Will there be a peaceful solution or a decisive military action? Please do leave a like and do comment if you viewed this video till now and have liked it. As always, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you have not already done so and press the bell icon to receive appropriate notification. Feel free to share this video in social media and to your friends by whichever means you would like to do so. Like always, I look forward to your comments, suggestions and continued support. Until next time, Jai Hind.